A couple of days ago, Starship took to the skies once again on its third test flight, and I'll say this. The world got to witness some of the most, if not the most, mind-blowing footage we've ever seen in the history of spaceflight. Starship jumped off the launch pad down at Boca Chica, Texas shortly past 8am, completed most of its milestones while giving us an unforgettable show with literal out-of-this-world video livestream quality thanks to Starlink, and then sadly the re-entry gods punished her lack of stability control while soaring into the atmosphere at almost 27,000 kilometers an hour, but not before we got to see the most incredible re-entry footage of any spacecraft we've ever gotten lucky enough to see. So, in this video we'll go over what happened during the flight, so you guys have a little bit of a detailed overview. So let's begin. Just like we saw during the second flight, Super Heavy had a perfect engine ignition sequence and pretty quickly left the pad with the Ship 28 sitting on top, headed to space. Once again, all 33 engines lit up and stayed on for the whole duration of the ascent, right up to stage separation via hot staging. Unlike on flight 2, this time around we got views from the camera on the right forward flap of Starship, and apart from the magnificent views, it also allowed us to see a nice, subtle trick that SpaceX uses to facilitate the stage separation. Now pay close attention to the grid fins on the booster. Can you see how they turn into a new position a couple of seconds prior to ship engine ignition, that's because being in that curved position will allow them to leverage the exhaust gases coming down from ship 28 to turn away from the carnage easier and faster. So that was pretty cool to see. Also, unlike on flight number two, the super heavy booster did not begin to fail almost immediately after it had separated from its best half, but went on to perform a smooth engine relight and boost back burn. We can see in the telemetry that all the 13 engines needed for the boost back successfully lit up for the whole burn duration and then they shut down nominally. It's interesting because this time we also saw a noticeable deceleration on the booster once the engines on Starship lit up and pushed both stages away and there was a lot of speculation of these being the reason behind Booster 9's demise during the previous flight, so whether this was the cause of the failure or not, it looks like whatever upgrades SpaceX performed on the booster actually worked pretty good it seems. So props to the booster team. Now after the boost back burn, Booster 10 began slowly turning around in order to point its bottom in the right direction, that is down, as it also began to re-enter the atmosphere. This whole process went pretty smoothly, and it was quite similar to what we're used to seeing with Falcon 9 landings, but um, the fun begins right around 50 kilometers in altitude, because it is at this point where we can see the grid fins begin to try and steer the booster in the right direction, while also providing it with stability as it starts re-entering the thicker parts of the atmosphere. And everything seems to go well up until the 7 kilometer mark, or thereabouts, uh, where we can clearly see the booster beginning to get these stabilized while the grid fins are trying their absolute best to keep this gigantic metal pipe controlled, but unfortunately that did not seem to help much because the booster ended up crashing hard into the water. At least it looks like that. We actually see some attempts to relight the engines as planned, but way too late and I think only a couple of them end up relighting and, well, that wasn't near enough to slow down the vehicle, which, if the telemetry is to be believed, ended up hitting the water at over 1000 kilometers an hour, or just shy of 700 miles an hour. SpaceX posted on their website that the booster's flight concluded at 462 meters above the surface, although it almost looks like it hit the water there. But uh, anyway, looking at the flight plan again, the landing burn should have started at 6 minutes and 46 seconds into the mission, which as we can see would have been at an altitude of 5 kilometers, but it doesn't and I have the suspicion that maybe it was the grid fins themselves that destabilized the booster because they were programmed to expect a strong deceleration which did not occur and so they began to go crazy. But just maybe. And uh, well, just... That's just a very speculative thought. So all in all, I would say that the Super Heavy Booster had a 95% successful mission. Only the very last stretch needs a little bit of work to nail that soft landing. Alright, moving on to the ship. Similar to Flight 2, it continued on its way into an almost orbital trajectory, but unlike with Ship 25, she went a lot farther than its predecessor, making it all the way to its targeted trajectory and shutting down its Raptor engines at a speed shy of 26,500 km an hour, 
or 16 and a half thousand miles an hour. Actually very, very close to normal orbital velocity that will allow the spacecraft to keep zooming around the Earth. But exactly the right speed for re-entering over the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and Australia. Once it reached its coast phase, the expected milestones for the ship were to perform a payload door opening and closing, an engine relight in space, a propellant transfer demonstration, and a controlled re-entry through the atmosphere with a hard landing in the ocean. The first one to go was the payload door opening, of which we got again some amazing views from the inside of the payload bay, where we can even see how the trapped air inside begins to rush out into the vacuum of, of space while leaving some really, really cool visual effects behind. Next in line was the door closing, which despite not really being able to see much from that camera angle, appeared to also go well, I believe, at least up to the very end where we can see it kind of pop out of place and then swing back and forth. But I'm confident they'll get that uh, fixed up as well for the upcoming flights. Uh, the next big milestone, especially important for the Artemis program, was the propellant transfer demo of which we have now heard from NASA that it was completed, although I believe it's not yet clear whether it was 100% successful or not, so I hope we get a little bit more clarity on that front soon. Next up was expected to be the in-space engine relight. This is also a crucial demonstration because SpaceX needs to make sure that they are capable of deorbiting this thing so that it does not become orbital debris. It was expected to be a prograde burn, meaning it would have burned in the direction that the ship was cruising in, which was also already going down, so it wouldn't have changed anything really uh, trajectory-wise, and would only be adding a little bit of extra speed for the uh, re-entry phase. Nonetheless, SpaceX decided to skip this step because the telemetry data was not looking favorable for an engine relight, and this probably has to do with what went wrong next. So we're now minutes away from the re-entry and we see Starship spinning around and rolling and nobody except for SpaceX themselves know whether this was intentional or not, at least earlier in the flight. Maybe they were testing how well the spacecraft can move around in space using the RCS thrusters, but what certainly did not look intentional was the seemingly uncontrolled rolling state Starship was in right up to the time when we see the first plasma trails begin to form, by which point we would expect a rock-solid vehicle facing in the right direction and this is the moment where we see the most mind-blowing re-entry footage I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> like, look at the plasma forming outside of the vehicle and the video quality we are able to get. This is, by the way, a new technology SpaceX were very eager to test. The idea is that because Starship is so big and blunt, it will allow the plasma wave to not completely close around behind the ship, but rather leave a hole open through which the uh, Starlink radio signal would be able to pass, thus maintaining good telemetry feed and even video. And I gotta say, I, I was not expecting it to work so well, at least while it lasted. Anyway, once Starship begins hitting the thicker parts of the upper atmosphere, at around 100 kilometers in altitude, we can start seeing the plasma wave forming on the outside of the ship, exactly at the right moment as it is about to face its belly side forward, which also seems to help it stop the uh, rolling motion. However, as Ship 28 keeps plunging deeper and deeper into the atmosphere and the plasma wave starts getting thicker and thicker, this vehicle does not seem to be having a particularly good time. We can see it first hitting the atmosphere with its right side uh, facing forward. It then keeps swinging and seems like it's moving its bottom forward, which kind of aligns with what we're seeing from the telemetry data. Then it moves upside down and all this while maintaining telemetry in high quality video feed. This keeps going for a couple of minutes until we lose video and then the last bits of telemetry data get sent at an altitude of 65 kilometers and a velocity of 25,700 kilometers an hour. So now you know what the biggest milestone for Flight 4 is going to be. Overall, this flight was a massive step forward for SpaceX and the Starship program. Many new milestones were achieved and in my eyes, it was a huge success. SpaceX has now begun an investigation together with the FAA to find out all the bits that went wrong during the flight and also why they went wrong. So let's hope they can update us on that soon. The uh, deluge system seems to also have done a 
perfect job of protecting the pad once again. So again, good news on that front as well. I can't wait to see what test flight number four will bring featuring ship 29 and booster 11. So with that, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.